in there. 80% of the mail is business mail, and we're a cheap distribution network for big business. Uh, the Postal Service was to great extent to brainwash the public. I shouldn't say brainwash, dry clean the public as to how great of a job this is. This job is hell. Absolutely hell. This is what we're catching here. Six hundred thousand people work for the Postal Service. Since 1970, when it was reorganized by Nixon, more and more mail is handled by machine. Postal management wanted to improve productivity, but for the postal worker, mechanization has meant more noise, more dust, more forced overtime, and more accidents. Postal workers today work under factory conditions but unlike other factory workers, postal workers do not have the right to strike. Three unions represent the nation's postal workers. The largest is the American Postal Workers Union. Metro, in the New York metropolitan area, is the largest local in the APWU. Despite the government ban on strikes, there has been no labor peace in the Postal Service. In the three contracts since 1970, there have been two major walkouts. No workers were fired. In 1978, the union policy was no contract, no work. Carter was trying to control inflation by clamping down on workers' wage increases, and he wanted the postal worker to be an example. When the old contract expired at midnight, July 21st, postal workers at the New York Bulk Center walked out, joined by workers from other facilities across the country. Their demands were end speed ups, no forced overtime, and pay increases to keep up with the cost of living. The last three years since 1975, we worked under a contract that's seen our job security eroded, our working conditions fall apart, and our money wages held intact while prices of living go up and up, and we are tired of it. They can't even feed their families on this contract. This isn't a decent contract for anyone. Postal inspectors, the secret police of the Postal Service, took extensive videotapes of the demonstrators, which were used against them. We have workers here being fired by postal inspectors because they were seen speaking to each other in the cafeteria. They put injunctions on us here. They're refusing to let us picket. They're refusing to let us hand out literature. The repression is unbelievable. People have to face surveillance 24 hours a day out here. Like right now. This is what's going on. We're being filmed and we're being fired. Being fired for, for these videotapes. Don't forget to get the cover to the bad man. Bad man. Hello. Postmaster General Bolger arbitrarily fired 200 of the thousands of protesting workers. Recently in the uh, difficulties we had in the early days of this agreement, a tentative agreement, I did uh, take the necessary action to fire the people that were involved in the illegal strike. Did you mean that to be a lesson? I didn't mean it to be a lesson, I meant that to uphold the law. Well, in this area we've had um, postal inspectors camping out outside people's doors, harassing them, harassing their neighbors, their wives and children. A woman worker here named Linda keys of her house were snatched from her brother and the postal inspectors broke in the door. This has been going on all over. They've been following people, trying to stop people from doing anything to communicate with their fellow workers. We definitely want to see better safety conditions. There's too much dust in the BMCs, far too much noise. 
the highest accident rate. The post office says they're committed to safety. The post office has bought these mechanical Star Treks <laughs> that are bruising up mail and bruising up people. And they're blaming it on the individual worker. If, you, if your job is clean and safe and healthy, you know, you can quibble over you in, your, in your own mind how much money it's worth. But when no matter how much money you work and your life is in danger or your hand might be cut off by a machine that you're working at, money doesn't matter. See, the union has not put themselves on the line. That's right. They are putting us on the line. Both employed and fired workers felt that the union leadership had sold them out by not calling a strike. That the union advocated a strike, and when the people went out on strike, they didn't back them. That's right. That's, that's the way I feel about it. I feel the union, it's their obligation to bring all the people back. That's right. Give them hell. That's what it we needs. We sold down the that's drain on a contract. Please. Don't let them sell you Don't out. Let Don't let them sell, sell you out. We're getting very angry with the way the union handling this. We want to go there, we want to tell them that we want amnesty, and we don't want no more stalls. Let's get this contract renegotiated, get amnesty for all the fire workers. In Newark, federal judge Lacey upheld the legality of the firings. That's all. And the as far as I'm concerned, the Nazis have more rights than I do. The Nazis can protest, do what they want, but I, the U.S. citizen, can't. So, I'm back, in, I'm back where I started, behind the eight ball. In the meantime, they got a contract, they're going to try and shove it on your throat, and you can't even live on it. Were, so, were you one of the ones that were fired? I was fired Friday morning. Fired workers felt that the union lawyer Klein did not fight for them in court. The, u the union is helping. Why is union? How are they helping us, Mr. Klein? By trying to... Wait a minute. Are you, are you representing us? As a whole, are I you representing, representing us? the union and its members. No, I, are you representing us? Uh, Just against us. That's fine. fine. You made every move in that court to block amnesty, and you know it. All of us are in court today. We've been fired. We've been served with injunctions. The union is not taking a positive stand on helping us worth a damn. Mo Biller, president of Metro, agreed it was a mistake not to have called a strike although he opposed the contract at the time. I say, I say we should have, we should have struck, right. The problems arose at that time, which seemed to be overwhelming, possibly because I was in Washington rather than in New York. I'm not going to alibi about it. There was a lot of confusion. But certainly I feel that we made a very fundamental error. I consider it one of the most serious errors of my career. Postal Workers Defense Committee, a rank-and-file group, was formed to fight for amnesty for the 200 fired workers. On our side, we had the rank and file, and we had some progressive union officials and some shop stewards. And the role of the defense committee was mobil to mobilize our side of it. That's why people went out to the various conventions, ran people for union offices, uh, leafleted all the stations in New York, put out a, a newspaper that was circulated nationally to be a core to rally people, not only behind the firings, but around all of the issues that affected the postal workers. In August, one month after the firings, the APWU held its national convention in Denver. Fired workers collected money at the plant gates to send a delegation to the convention. National President Emmett Andrews expected a tight convention, but many delegates supported the war and opposed the contract. Hundreds of delegates demonstrated against the contract. Their target, National President Emmett Andrews. I never quit in uh, any fight, and I like a good fight. Do you think the contract is worth standing up for? I think so, and be here on behalf of the future of everybody in this business, the Postal Service and uh, our people here, uh, well, I think, uh, well, it's the best I could get. I go on record to stand that the National Committee, the Bargaining Committee, 
Emin Andrews and his boys did not bargain in fear. In fairness, they were not allowed to bargain that they have sold out the rank and file, and I make those charges. This last contract, we had people in our office with like 28 to 30 years service, and I never thought they would go on strike, but this time they were ready. I spent four and a half years in World War II and 36 months of that overseas in combat, and I don't want anybody to tell me that I can't walk because I walk. I walk in it and I recommend it to anybody, and don't mind who I recommend it to. Not only were most of the delegates against the contract, but they also voted support for the fired workers. Well, I feel they should be rehired because I feel if they didn't go out on strike that uh, maybe a lot of the stuff wouldn't have started. I felt that they were the leaders and there's nobody protecting them now. I think definitely if this union does not support those 200 workers as out of a job, we can forget it. The government will destroy us. So what do I think about their walking out? What else could they do? They, can't, they won't sign a contract. They tell you that's not negotiable. Well, it's up to them to tell you what's negotiable and what's not negotiable. Heck, you got to fight them. It had never happened before. All three unions voted down the postal contract overwhelmingly. By forcing negotiations to reopen, there was a chance to make amnesty a contract demand. Postmaster General Bolger continued the hard line. Having turned down that contract, the unions now want us to return to the bargaining table. But as far as I'm concerned, we did our bargaining. I could not in good conscience agree to anything more at a bargaining table now. Postmaster General has taken a hard line. Only a hard line on the union side can win a decent contract and amnesty for the fired workers. The survival of our union and its very credibility is at stake. With pressure from the rank and file, Bolger had to sit down with union leaders. However, only two issues were renegotiated. Removal of limitations on the cost of living allowance and the no layoff clause. From here, the contract went to binding arbitration. The final contract was out of the workers' hands. There was no mention of mandatory overtime, no mention of safety, no mention of amnesty for the 200 fired workers. It was clear that Andrews and the national leadership opposed the fight for amnesty. At the local level, fired workers had fought to get the Metro leadership to take a strong stand. At this crucial point, Mo Biller moved to eliminate shop steward elections in the New York area. So the whole purpose was that contrary to my own beliefs, and my theoretical beliefs continue to be election because it's a grassroots thing, it's not an alibi, I still felt that we were not developing a stable steward system, mm -hmm. and uh, when people are so-called stiffs, we have to get rid of them, period, mm -hmm. and it's much easier to get rid of somebody you appoint. You just dump them, and that's it. No, I want to see ID. Where's he work, man? ID. We just had a vote there uh, for a constitutional amendment. Uh, the vote was, t the constitutional amendment that was proposed was that there be no more election of stewards, that there be only appointment of stewards by the president. It was defeated. A majority, there was a majority vote, but it needed a two-thirds amendment to win. It did not get the two-thirds amendment. And you yourself, what do you think of the uh, proposed amendment? I voted against it. Why? Why? Because I am for the democratic, democratic system of elections of stewards. I voted against it. Why? I'd rather have a democratic union where we elect our own stewards. I think we more or less know who is and who isn't qualified better than they can. And the people that voted for it don't work on the floor in the places they work in, in offices, executive offices. You know, they don't know people that work on the floor. They don't know what the hell's going on out there. They don't know what troubles we face or how do they know what kind of defense we need. What went on inside was beautiful because I believe in a people, the people. I just want to, I just want to say one thing. The strike, the strike at the box centers, the rank and file rejecting the contract, 
and the defeat of this amendment are all part of the same thing. Make and file moving! And out of this thing where they try to eliminate good shop stewards, we could end up with 200 better shop stewards. But yet, what concerns me is the union. You do, do not have their support. Now, that really comes, concerns me. So that means we got to have the people behind us. Even with the union leadership... Kenny Liner, a fired worker and an active member of the Postal Workers Defense Committee, ran for election as a vice president of the APWU. And he won. The fired workers and the defense committee were gaining national support. The hard line taken by postal management had contributed to worsening safety on the job. Since 1978, fewer and fewer grievances had been won. This was a direct result of the union's weak stand on the firings. Working conditions worsened. As a present shop store, we have not been able to win any grievances inside the facility at step one or step two. It almost seems like it's a pre-planned thing for management to deny everything we bring up there since July 21 last year. Between 1976 and 1979, there had been 60 work-related deaths in the Postal Service. There were more accidents in 1979 in the Jersey City Bulk Mail Center than there were employees. Clearly, your, your workers are unhappy about something. And you say that this agreement was fair and have enough money. Do you think they're unhappy about their working conditions, all the mechanization that you've been putting in, the machines, and the depersonalization of the jobs that they have? I think uh, you find this not only in the Postal Service, but in all the industries where you go into automation or mechanization, the employee finds it difficult to adjust to. Uh, we're trying to, we have a program that we call the Quality of Working Life. Uh, we're making quite a bit of, uh, quite a few studies, quite a few inquiries into this to see what we can do to uh, make the job more enjoyable for the postal employee. As a steward, I used to go to the medical office all the time with people who in fact were sick or were injured, and they'd continually tell them they were fit for duty. One day I took the nurse aside and I said, well, what kind of criteria do you have for whether people... She said, well, unless they're bleeding or unconscious, I consider them fit for duty, you know? And uh, that's the way it went. You'd go to the quack down in the medical office, he'd say you were fit for duty. They'd do anything to keep people on the job. Metro began to support the fired workers. Hundreds of workers took part in demonstrations organized by the Metro Amnesty Committee. If you're driving your vehicle, be very careful in traffic. If you're working on the machines inside, be very careful because Bolger isn't going to give a ticker's damn of what happens to you. The union is now supporting us is because they have finally fa felt threatened themselves. They see that this is not only a, a, a strike against postal workers, but a, a strike against postal unions or unions of all kinds. If they are allowed to get away with this, this will almost start the beginning of the abolishment of unions because this has shown that the union has no strength. They have just uh, disregarded the fact that we had a union at all. They have just trampled on our union and then us in turn. So if the union don't do anything here, then the union can just as well pull out and go away and disappear because it won't be no good no more. Months passed. The fired workers were still out of work. On July 21st, 1979, one year after the walkout, many angry and determined workers camped out in front of the bulk mail center in Jersey City. Hey, Madison, get over here, you pineapple. The fired workers call the encampment Bolgerville, named after the postmaster general who had put them there. Yeah. 
As we stated before, we would have been back on the job a long time ago if it was not for the betrayal by the national union leaders, Emmett Andrews and Lonnie Johnson, who signed a contract with 200 workers on the street. And now Emmett Andrews has shown what he thinks of the fired workers. He is refusing to appeal the arbitrations that is lost. He is refusing to seek amnesty. And to highlight that, he just threw me out of office that I was elected to for two years by the membership. And he's spitting in the face of that membership, spitting in the face of democracy. I'm proud to see all our brothers and sisters out here and we're more determined than ever to win this fight. Make no mistake about it, Mr. Inspector. We're going to win this fight. And when we get back inside, you're going to pay the consequences. You are leaving scars. You're leaving scars that are not going to be removed. So take that back to your un-American cohorts, your colleagues, your cronies. Take that message back. When we get back inside, the scars remain. And you will pay the consequences. Thank you. And we are going to win. Make no mistake about it. We're going to win this thing. In every walk of life, there's nasty jobs to do. Spying on your fellow man is nothing new. time came, the most dangerous time of the year for postal workers. With the fired workers still on the street, morale in the bulk was low. On December 15, 1979, Michael McDermott, 25-year-old mail handler at the Jersey City Bolt was trapped in a conveyor belt and crushed to death. Two hundred postal workers attended the funeral. A particular machine, a Mike McDermott, we just found this out from at the Osher inspection, found that all the limited switches and the relays that if somebody got jammed, the machines were removed years ago so that the, the mail wouldn't stop moving. And also, there was no shin guard on the machine, and there was no limit switch. But the, the main damn thing was, if there was a shin guard, then he could have locked his body, maybe his arm or his leg, and he wouldn't have got sucked entirely into the machine. But the thing we found out that really makes us mad is that there's a jam relay inside the machine that was removed so that if a box or a body got stuck in there, it would stop, but they took it out. Fifteen postal workers die on the job each year. But Michael McDermott's death was different. It came in the wake of a long and hard struggle in which health and safety was an important issue. Well, there was a mail handler working the truck in an outbound extendable conveyor. He got caught in the conveyor belt. 
the safety limit switch on the front end side of the conveyor belts are wired out as a matter of routine because they interfere with production and the guy was killed. He was sucked right into the conveyor belt and ripped apart. And you complained to management about the safety condition many, before? Oh, many, many times. times. There was a foreman that covered the same area and shut down the bays for them being unsafe. He was demoted because he shut down those very bays for they were unsafe. Right. He was That's demoted right. to being a clerk. Why did you decide to come out here and demonstrate tonight? Because we felt the need to. We Man felt the need dead. to expose this and like show people like that the post office is a very, you know, is, has a lot of safety hazards in it. And we want to show everybody that, you know, we just want to show everybody this. They haven't heard the end of this. They're not going to kill one of ours and, let, and get away with it with nothing happening in this place. No cover up. <laughs> The workers forced politicians to hold a congressional hearing. However, they had to chant outside the doors for 30 minutes before they were admitted. Let the workers in! 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 The hearings began on January 7th, 1980. Honorable Congressman and my fellow, my husband's fellow workers. My husband Michael was a good family man and he was a hard worker. He never did complain about the conditions which prevailed, such as heavy sacks and belts continuously going and never stopping. He was told to go back to work or else he would be fired. I will never understand until the day Michael was killed why he ever stayed on that job. He would come home at night complaining about his back and how his gloves and his pants were caught and torn because of the conveyors being stripped of its safety devices. Who is to blame for my husband's death? Are the postal supervisors to blame? Maybe they didn't care and wanted the mail sacks out. Is it not their duty to check these conveyor belts periodically themselves? Is this what a life is worth at the Postal Service, a sack of mail? My plea is that the bulk center where my husband was killed be made safe for all workers so that the workers can work free of fear of being injured or killed. Some will forget my husband, Michael McDermott, after this. But all I have left is memories and snapshots of him. My daughter will never know who her daddy was. My husband was my whole life. They not only took his, but they also took mine and my daughter's. Thank you. It has been brought out and will be further proved that postal management from bottom to top had repeatedly been made aware of the dangerous safety hazards, yet refused to take corrective action. We are here today to demand that Bolger and his accomplices, including Gallione, <coughs> the general manager, Frank Schmidt, the former general manager, Dee Charanti, the director of mail processing, Bojan, manager of plant maintenance, and the rest of the local bulk management and postal inspectors involved be held accountable for their criminal negligence and face criminal charges for the death of Mike McDermott. If you have a negligence inspection and your safety people have been inspecting the plant, how do you justify the fact that there are 12 serious violations on May 23 that were outlined by OSHA in the report? There's no way I can defend that. And isn't it true that right after the accident, there are other conveyor belts that were taken offline the next day because they also were defective? Oh, yes. Yes, we took, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, Congressman, even today there are bays that do not, that have these, these, these particular problems, but I, they are, are not being used. But you took 11 bays off the line as a result of the uh, 
uh, as a result of the accident that happened on Bay 23. They can close on the portals the next day. All right, we took a lot more than 11 off the line. Why did you take them off the line, sir? Because they did not meet what OSHA was indicating was a problem. How come these avoided your inspections, if inspections were in fact made by you and your safety people? Well, again, you, you say made by me. I, unfortunately, Congressman, I cannot, you know, I cannot give you any reasons why they were in the condition they were. Who is responsible for the policy in the New York fault plan? Is it you, Mr. Jellison, or is it Mr. Bolger? Where does the buck stop, sir, in your opinion? I guess the buck stops at the uh, installation head, I would imagine, myself. The supervisor is to establish the severity of the uh, potential hazard. Some, the equipment is not to be used till it's fixed. Some, it can be used in a different uh, mode. And some, it can be, uh, you have an abatement period of uh, X number of days. And that's a process that should be followed. So therefore, it's up to the whim of the plant manager as to whether or not a person is to work on defective equipment or not. The, no the whim? There is no I, 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 I can't answer the question manager. with that terminology. It's not up to the whim of the plant manager. Well, is there any other procedure within the plant that can shut down the equipment or that the employees would not be forced to work on defective equipment if the plant manager is so so fit? If the plant manager determined that it was safe enough to work, would we work it? Is that the question? That's right. Yes, we would. And if the man did not accede to the directive of the plant management, would he be dismissed? He would be uh, ordered to, uh, to operate the equipment, and then he was, his uh, procedure would be to file a grievance. Then there is no check and balance system to protect the working man that's set up in that plant. Is that correct? That the authoritative head... The bureaucratic chief is whatever the plant manager who just testified that he knows nothing about safety, that he is not an engineer, is to make this determination. Is that what you're telling this committee, sir? That's what I'm telling this committee, sir. And you feel that the dismissal of 156 <coughs> employees has contributed to the lack of the morale? No. <coughs> feel that safety is tied up with morale? Yes. And that it is part of having a productive uh, and uh, safe place to work, to have a good spirit and core morale in the plant? Yes. What is done to raise the level of the morale in the plant today, sir? Since Mr. Gallione has gone out there, I, I repeat, and I think it is important in morale that uh, housekeeping has uh, uh, improved. They swept up. When you go to work at the Bulk Center, you are going to work for an employer whose main method of dealing in employee relations is repression, is outright repression. And so the employee's attitude, and Mrs. McDermott laid this out, I think I could, no one could do it better, is Jesus, it's unsafe, but I gotta have a job, I got a family, I gotta do it. I was fired for nine months. I came back and foreman up and down the line with telling people. You don't follow what we tell you, which includes working in unsafe conditions. You'll be out there the way they are. And to a man, everybody at work knows that these people that were fired were fired unjustly for standing up against management and around the safe conditions. It's very difficult to talk. <laughs> I'm just glad it's over, and I just hope it proves something, really, that's all. I see you have an amnesty button on. How? Why did you hit the amnesty button for the five workers on it? Because I think somebody, something should be done about it for them. I support them. On January 9th, 1980, Gallione resigned as manager of the Jersey City Bulk. But Gallione was just a scapegoat. Bolger and other top management are responsible for conditions in the Postal Service. The fight won't be over until all the fired workers get their jobs back, until no one is forced to work a 60-hour week, until no one gets killed by management neglect.